Welcome to Revolutionize Your Retirement Radio, bringing you insights and strategies to help you create a magnificent and fulfilling second half of life. Here's your host, certified professional retirement coach and best-selling author, Dr. Dorian Mincer. I want to welcome everybody to my fourth Tuesday Revolutionize Your Retirement interview with Expert Series. I'm Dory Mincer, owner of Revolutionize Retirement and your host for the series. So without further ado, I want to introduce Carrie Hannon. And those of you who've been part of my series since May of 2012, when I started, Carrie has been our guest, I think, maybe three or four times. She's so prolific in her writing. <laughs> and so I try to have her on the show, you know, when a book or a couple of books have come out. And she's a leading authority and strategist on both work and jobs, career transitions, entrepreneurship, leadership, personal finance, and retirement. She's a frequent TV and radio commentator and is a sought-after keynote speaker at conferences. She's the best-selling and award-winning author of 14 books now, and her latest, as I just mentioned, is Great Pajama Jobs, Your Complete Guide to Working from Home, and her upcoming book, In Control at 50 Plus, How to Succeed in the New World of Work, is scheduled to be released in November of this year. She's covered all aspects of careers, business, and personal finance as a col columnist, editor, and writer for the nation's leading media companies and has appeared as a career and financial expert on national news programs. In addition to practical advice for midlife workers seeking to land jobs, find professional and personal rewards, and ride the age wave of longevity with grace, a key passion for Carrie is helping and advising women on how to take charge of their own financial planning at all stages of their lives to prepare for a financially secure future. She lives in Washington, D.C. with her husband, documentary producer and editor Cliff Hackle, and actually just mentioned she has a new puppy. What's your puppy's name? Her name is Ellie. It's short for Elmore. Mount Elmore in Vermont is what she's named for. But Zena was my old Labrador who passed away in January, so now we've got right. puppy madness in our house. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm glad that you you have new energy there, then, and I'm sorry I know how, how important Zena was to you over these years. So, well, I am so delighted that you're here today, and, you know, when Carrie first wrote this book, it was at the beginning of the pandemic, and I know we're sort of toward the end, or, you know, things are changing, but there's been so much that we've learned in terms of, of work, you know, during this whole time. And so, you know, the book is still so apropos. So what led you to write this book? And, you know, why don't we just start with that? Well, okay. But first of all, I want to say, Dory, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> pleasure to be with you today, and I just this whole group that gathers for for these discussions and 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 talks it's just it's just magic, and I think we all really help each other sort of make sense of the the road ahead and this book is really quite fun because I started great pajama jobs back in twenty nineteen in the summer of twenty nineteen mm -hmm. so way before any of this was going on but but the thing is remote working was bubbling up it was something that older workers were seeking more autonomy, the ability to be flexible about working in and out of the office. And actually, younger workers were saying, hey, you know, we're digital natives. We we don't need to come to an office all the time. We can we know we can do our job from different locations. And employers were starting to go, aha, yes, we can save a little money this way because we can we don't need as much office space and in fact we can pull talent from all over the world and not just people in our community so there were it was really starting to become a trend when my manuscript was due right about when everybody was sent home in March, I called my editor and said, you know, I think I need a little more time. So they stretched out my, my deadline a bit. And so I was able to kind of ramp it up and say, okay, what's happening here? And the lessons learned, you know, this last year has been difficult for, for many people adjusting to working remotely, but 
it, it can be an amazing situation, and particularly for older workers, in my opinion, and the ones I spoke to in terms of battling ageism. And so that's kind of what the impetus, and now the genie is out of the bottle. I think these trends, this is a major trend post-pandemic in the new world of work. And so, you know, I'm happy to dig into some of the some of the interesting bits about working from home and, and anything else you want to chat about. Fabulous. And I do want to recommend your book to people. It's it's really a, it's so helpful because you, you mention a lot of different kinds of professions that people can work in as well as tips on how to get jobs. I mean, it's a really – because the whole final part of it is sort of a workshop on tips on how to, to negotiate the – the world. So we'll talk about that now. But you just mentioned about it helps older older workers. In what can you expand on that? In what ways does do you think remote work helps fight ageism? Or yeah, Jory, it, here's the yeah. yeah, I think it really really and truly does. And and here is why. When you are working from a home office or remotely, you're not being judged on how you look right? You're being judged on your performance and your productivity and your professionalism. And yes, 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 that's that's true when you're in an office, but there's something very subtle that can happen when you're in a workplace with various generations. And and it's not that people are overtly saying that they're recognizing your your age or your seniority, so to speak, but but visually you you can give off a vibe that you're older. Yeah. And I think not having that physical reminder can be hugely beneficial to an older worker when you're combating those very subliminal messages of ageism. The second piece of it is if you have any mobility issues or any health issues that make commuting sort of a drag, this is fantastic, right? <laughs> it's really, you can, you can find work that you might not have been able to have otherwise. And, or you may have had longer commutes. And even something as simple, Dory, as, hey, and I have this, really, as you get older, some of us have bad night vision. Like, I mean, I hate driving at night. And if I had to do a commute from an office where I was driving, it would just be a, you know, really, you know, not a pleasant thing. And being able to work remotely can wipe out some of those things. It's really true. So many people have said that well, also it helps with finances because you don't necessarily have to buy all the extra clothes nor the, you know, the car insurance, you know, time to have to commute and all of those things. What, what, do you, what are some of the things you think that people have learned this year? And, and in what ways do you think, you know, what are your thoughts on, you know, people making decisions, though, about going back to work or continuing remote, do you think it's going to continue as a major trend so that, you know, people can really look to it as as, a, as an important way to be employed? I do, Doria. I, I honestly, as I was saying kind of before, the genie's out of the bottle. This is remote work isn't going away. And in fact, it's, it's becoming, it, it's, it's really becoming more of an important avenue for work for many people and particularly for workers over 50. So this is going to continue forward and employers get it. Employ, a lot of employers really are embracing it and have learned how to make it work. Others had started the process before, but I honestly think, but, but the real sweet spot for many of us, and everybody's different about what what kind of job you do and whether you need that interaction physically one-on-one -on -one with people or in group meetings, or whether you can actually perform your job very comfortably from your home office. And so it, it really is hard to have a blanket statement about this. And some people are naturally introverts and really enjoy their own mm. company and other people. You know, so, and if you're a writer, maybe it's great to work from home. And if you're, you know, somebody with a project manager, maybe you want to be in the office. So those are kinds of jobs will define you and your personality will define you. But I think this sweet spot's going to be having a hybrid situation where you can work from home. And you also have opportunities to engage in an office because there is something to be said about being seen. And particularly if you're at an age, and as we know, workers of 50 and workers in their 60s have, may have different goals and aspirations and ambitions. And if you're in your 50s, maybe, and you're still eyeing promotions and getting ahead in the game, it really might behoove you to be in front in center with your boss mm. from time to time. I think that physical presence, 
the, in terms of being thought of for the assi- new assignments, for, you know, taking on projects. Having been in front of somebody really is going to be helpful still. So I, I, there's going to be a way that many of us are going to want to find a hybrid situation. And you mentioned, too, I mean, one of the things I also like about your book is you, you talk about the over 50 worker, but also sort of the role of remote work for younger workers. And, you know, when people are starting out, the contacts in the office sometimes are even more important than, you know, as we get older, we might not need quite as much of that, although, you know, certainly benefit from from some of those, you know, kind of informal conversations that occur. I mean, that's one of the things that you don't have so much with remote work is that there is that more isolation. But you also mentioned in the book there doesn't have to be as much isolation. What have you learned? Because I know you've worked, for, you know, you predominantly work remotely, right? I do, yeah. Um, but I make a I make a point of whenever possible, and I kick and drag myself out the door. But now that the world's back open again, and prior to it shutting down, to get out and meet people, go have that coffee with a colleague that's in from out of town, or go to that conference. That's you know the things I'm like, oh, I can't really go away, or I really can't spend two hours or three hours. That's a time zap, but it's those. uh personal connections that really fire me up and build my network, even where I am today in my career. I thrive on Dory when I can go to a conference and run into you right. or, or yeah. your guest from last month, Helen Dennis or whatever. I mean, I love yeah. seeing everybody and it gets me all fired up about my work again and I get new ideas. And so I think it's critical that when you're a remote worker, you seek out those opportunities to get out of your space and, you know, get into the world, you know, and do that. Now, I just want to address the point you made about younger workers. I do, you know, I have a real, I feel for the younger workers who started new jobs during the pandemic, for example, because how difficult it is to on-ramp into a new company remotely. It's really, really challenging. You you, you don't have that camaraderie to learn the ropes to, and also from an employer's perspective, to build that loyalty within, you know, get someone proud of the mission and, and that sense of a team and we're all together here. When you're isolated, it it's really difficult. And if, and if you're starting out and you've got these little niggle questions, you just want to run across the hall and ask somebody or tap the person at the, you know, at the desk next to you. And you can't do that easily. It becomes harder and and I think it, it has been very challenging. I've, I've talked to a lot of younger workers as well in the past year mm-hmm. about their, you know, how hard it's been for them. And again, it is by the kind of work they do makes the difference as well. Also, I, I wouldn't, when, and Dory, I bet you're the same way. When I think of the people I worked with in an office in my 20s and my 30s and my 40s, Man, I'm still friends with these people. I have these connections, these networks, and they were built from, hey, let's go to lunch or let's have a drink after work or, you know, you have this convincing around with people and it's not necessarily work related, but you build this, these friendships over years. And when you don't go into an office, you really, I think it is a sacrifice. So you have to make that extra effort to reach out and meet these people whenever you can or make that, hey, let's make it a real phone call. Call. And sometimes that's easier mm-hmm. than a Zoom call or something because right. you have to put on your makeup in my situation you know, or whatever it might be. You know, and sometimes just that old fashioned phone call works, but it's reaching out. You know, I agree with you totally. And I think during the pandemic, I mean, like I've been totally, you know, working remote. And before I used to work partly remote with coaching clients and then in person therapy. And now it's everybody. And, you know, phone calls and Zoom calls just to have friendly chats with colleagues and friends is so important just to, you know, so that you're not so isolated. So, but what are some of the key? Oh, go ahead. Sorry, what else? Another thing, it's even shooting off that, you know, random email, like, I just finished this book I thought you would like, yeah. it, even if it has mm-hmm. nothing to do with your work. Like, you know, I finished reading Brandy Carlisle's book yesterday, and I must have sent out a note to about six or seven of my colleagues today saying, hey, mm-hmm. you know, if you're looking for something to read over Memorial Day weekend, you know, pick mm-hmm. this up. And it's just about how a, a young woman started her career as a music, but it, it, it's fascinating, like the networking mm-hmm. and all the things we all right. apply to our career. So at any rate, it doesn't have to be a business this note, it's reaching out just right. with a quick email, it's putting something, something up on Facebook or LinkedIn or, you know, sending out a tweet. It, it doesn't have to take much time. 
Right. And you're, you're an incredible role model in relation to that of using social media. I'm always so impressed with seeing how much you're out and about in those ways. Um, <laughs> well, I try not to bore people with dog pictures, but, you know, or horse pictures. <laughs> oh, but those are nice, too. Though. I, I like seeing those. So what are some of the keys to being a successful remote worker? I mean, I know you talk a lot about it in the book, and I think for the listeners, you know, what 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 are the keys? What what helps you be successful as a remote worker? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And and I don't I honestly believe over the last 12 months or so, we've all kind of shuffled our feet and figured out how to do this. But it comes down to this, and it's lessons that apply to being in an office as well, but certainly remotely. It's, it's number one is communication. And it's really what you and I were just talking about, Dory, is the ability to not isolate yourself, to continue to communicate. And and older workers over 50 are particular, this is one of our strong suits, is we're excellent communicators in terms of verbal and written communications. And so I think it's really important to make sure that you hone your, your communication skills. And if it's and it's not true at all about older workers and technology. It's never been any study has ever shown that we're at not any less adept at it. But the pandemic has definitely shown the ability when you're savvy with doing a Zoom call and all of those sort of go to meetings or whatever it might be. That that's important. That's a way of communicating and it's it's critical. So being a good communicator and also being open with who are you working with, who are your colleagues, who's your boss, and how do they like to communicate? These are don't just fall back on what you are comfortable with, but maybe someone really does prefer just getting a text versus an email or a phone call because it's quick, it's easy, it's quickly, yeah, saw that, got it, on I go. So it's always important to have that upfront conversation with whoever you're working with on a project or your boss about how do they like to communicate, number one. Number two is going to be discipline, discipline, discipline. You know, you want it to be really keep it. I believe in having a very good schedule and creating those boundaries for your schedule. And, yeah, you can give it a little on, on each end and at different times when you need to, but it's important to be professional. And when you sit down to start your day at work, you have a disciplined schedule. I like to, you know, although my book is Great Pajama Jobs, I personally get dressed as if I'm going to work <laughs> because mm-hmm. I do think it sets your mind to, you know, to, to you. Okay. Now my day has started. Okay. I'm on. Mm-hmm. I, I have shifted that. So I do think it's important to have that sort of boundary between work and home and that discipline. And the third piece is really self-care. And, and Dory, I know you probably talk to your clients about this a lot as well. It's we all want to, you know, be good workers, and it's very tempting to to burn out and overwork when we're working remotely because we're trying, we're dancing so fast, and we want to make sure that nobody's saying you're not getting your work done, you're not being productive, you're, you know, a step behind. So we overdo it, and we say yes to everything, and we let people step into our time frame. You need to pause and say, okay, now, I am taking this break right now. I'm going to step away from the computer. I'm going to go read something that's in a book or I'm going to call my mother or I'm going to take the dog for a walk. Whatever it is you do, build those moments into your day where you back away from work. You make sure you're eating with an eye to nutrition and taking the time to drink and stay hydrated. I know that sounds, that's not about work, but it is. And I, Mm -hmm. frankly, I'll get so immersed in my work if I'm writing something, if I'm on deadline, I forget to eat and I forget uh, some of those skills, those things I tell people to do. And trust me, you're not doing your best work when you don't take care of yourself. So those are some of the the key pieces of, of being a successful remote worker. Great. And what about, do you have any advice on how how older workers go about applying? I know you talk about it in the book, but can you kind of give some insight to people now on, on how to even explore what's out there? Right. Now, here's the beauty of it. There are some fabulous websites, really, truly, that are geared towards remote workers, right? And and it's real like I love flexjobs.com. It's one and remote.co and the woman who founded that is, is Sarah Sutton is just tremendous and has done an amazing job with that site. And there's all kinds of opportunities there. There's help, there's you know, articles on careers. There's but there's some really they they track the top one hundred employers for remote workers, which they graciously allowed me to have access to their list to write about in my book, Great Pajama Jobs. And they identified the top 
jobs and, and remote jobs and where the most hiring is going on. So they give you these guideposts and these, these sort of signals to help you kind of think about what kind of remote work you want to do. Another great one is work at home. That's way work at home vintage experts, I think it is. And that's great. It's for, she's been around for a long time. The woman who started that, she's tremendous. And it's jobs for folks in the insurance and banking industries primarily, but she's been moving into accounting and some other areas. HR maybe. So it's worth checking that out as well. But there's working nomads and side hustle. And there's, if you look at my book, there's a bunch of them. If any listeners want a list, I'm happy to put together a little PDF and send it around to folks as well, because there's some great websites. So what I say there is, okay, and, uh, you know, take a look at those and, and see what's happening. Who's hiring for remote work? And what do you want? Do you want a contract job? Do you want to work seasonally? What what are you, a three-month assignment? What are you really looking for? Because that's important. You need to do that soul-searching about what kind of work do you want? What what are the hours that you're interested in and so forth? And so look at those. Now, most jobs, of course, if you're applying online, you have to have all the your resume set up so you hit all the keywords that are in the job posting and so forth. And it's also important to Note, you know, note in those job descriptions, what are the skills? What are they asking for in the jobs that interest you? And if you don't have those skills, try to find a way to add them. And there's so many wonderful opportunities for online education right now to get a certification, to get, you don't need a full-blown degree program, but you can get up to speed in a lot of different categories and things that kind of just, just give a little spiff and polish to your resume and to your skill set. So those are important clues to help you start, you know, presenting yourself as a great candidate. Now, the bottom line is this, and I say this, as much as I love online job boards as as your clues to where to hire and who's hiring and great information, I honestly think the real path as you get older to finding a job is, again, who you know at the company and who can get you inside that door for, for an interview. It's just sending a resume online is so discouraging and it can be such a black hole and particularly if you're salary demands are somewhat high if you're looking to replicate an old salary. It can be tricky. And, you know, those jobs often go to people who are younger workers who aren't asking for, have high salary demands because they're low risk. I mean, it's low lying fruit for an employer to to bring somebody in. To bring someone in with expertise and, and slightly more expensive is more of a risk and it's a little bit harder for you to get that call back. So you need to take those clues, think about the companies who, who have jobs right now and who really you would, you've got to love the company. You have to have that mission, that desire to want to work for that company really helps you. And they get on LinkedIn and find out who do you know who could connect you to somebody there. It doesn't have to be your particular colleague or friend, but somebody who knows somebody is just as great who can give you that informational, inter, you know, you can do that informational interview with them to find out more about the company and who, you know, what's the atmosphere? What's the fit? Would you fit in there? So it's kind of multi-tiered how you go about the job search at this point, but it, it truly is. It's who you, it's who you know that can get you in the door. It, companies still like to hire people who they have been referred to them. And it's that it's it's a safer bet for them, and it's also a more comfortable situation to invite you in for a hire. So it, tell everyone you know and ask everyone you know who it is you know, but it's often that second or third connection that's really going to help you. That's really helpful. I've, I've had a few people who've asked the question, if you could repeat again the websites that you mentioned. You know, you said flexjob.com, remote work. Dot co working nomad yeah. the the what's the work at home vintage experts yes is that the so that one is let me give you the correct URL for that one hang on one sec and and I mean there's the Rat Race Rebellion is another one there's there's just a bunch of really the wave is w a h v e dot com and it's sort of it's been a real game changer and Sharon Emick is the woman who started that back in 2010 and I'm a huge fan of Sharon's I've met her on many occasions and interviewed her and that I would I highly recommend that site and I've I've interviewed many people who have found work through that site. 
website, as I have with the Flex Job site and some of the others. So, but again, in my book, there's there's a good list of of other sites, and as again, I'm happy to probably if you search my name in sites, it might even come up because I probably put them in articles I've written as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, if you're able to pull you know some of the ones you mentioned today together, that could be sent out as a PDF. That'd be wonderful. But but For also, sure. I just I, want to I, say that. Pardon? Oh yeah, I'm happy to do that, Dory. I can uh, I can send that to you, and you can share it with with our, our our folks who are on today. That would be terrific. I'll I'll ask Donna to be able to post it. So that I think what I'll have her do is post it um, on the event page. So for all of you to know when you decide to listen to the recording, you'll be able to to see it on the event page because I doubt she'll have it in time before she sends out the uh, recording this afternoon. So, And, and I, I do want to say the amount of resources in the book is phenomenal. I had not heard of most of the places that you mentioned, Carrie, and yeah. you know, I, I realized that I'm, you know, although often I will make try to make suggestions to people, I mean, you, you just, I mean, there's just all these sites that I wasn't even aware of, like the one you just mentioned, the W-A-H-Z-E, the Work at Home Vintage Experts. It sounds you have some great examples in the book about the kind of jobs people have gotten through that. One yeah. question that I'm going to integrate right now from Ellen, who's in New York. She says, now that women are embracing their naturally gray hair, do you think the workplace will be more accepting of this look when we get back to the live office? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I have a lot We're talking of about ageism. <laughs> I, I have a lot of friends who have gone that route, but you know, goodness, it's it's hard to say. But I do think there's a new sense of of empowerment that women have sort of t- taken out of this last year as well, with all the attention we've had on you know, gender issues and racial issues and so forth. So I I honestly think our workplaces have been transformed in many ways based on the new sensitivity that started to to bubble up this past year. So I I say hooray for gray hair, and I hope that 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 is what we're seeing. But, oh, gosh, I have to use this one minute, though, to say my favorite favorite mantra, though, is for women and for men, you know, get physically fit. (laughs) You know, if you've been sitting at home working on your computer in your home office, the best way to fight ageism when when we're looking at superficial things like gray, whether your hair is gray or not or whether you've got wrinkles, is get out and get some sort of fitness program, whether it's walking or swimming or something that you do a couple of times a week so that, you know, you have a level of fitness. And again, the eating with I do nutrition because it gives you this positive attitude, this can-do spirit, this energy from being physically fit. And and your office mates or your boss or your employer, they're not going to notice exactly what it is about you. But when you have that sort of up vibe that comes from being physically fit, they it goes right past any gray hair you might have. And they want you on their team. They want to be with you. They want they want you to rub off on them. Mm. Really good advice, and I know I've heard you say that many times, and it's true. And it's part of the statistics <laughs> that, yeah, no, no, but it's so true that by the time you're 65, it's what the, I think the research says it's 30 percent genetics, which is big if you've got genetic factors, but 70 percent of things we can have some control over, you know, our eating, our exercising, our body and brains, meaningful relationships, connection, engagement, purpose and meaning, all of those things. And, you know, the study out of Yale with Becca Levy is people live seven years longer, you know, with positive, more positive attitudes about aging and themselves. So, you know, it's, it has to do with longevity there. <laughs> yeah, no, without question. So I know, tell us a little, I know you have this new book that's going to come out in the fall on how to succeed in the new workplace for workers over 50. So what are you seeing as the major trends coming out of the pandemic for workers over 50? And I think the hybrid model you mentioned might be part of it, but what what have you seen? What are you going to focus on in this new book? Yeah, we definitely, you know, there's been a big shift in the, in the, in the workplace and we're just sort of figuring it out now. So I, I, I hate to say that I'm an authority on what exactly it's going to take to succeed, but I do know these three, these particularly three things are going to continue for workers over 50 to be the major trends coming out of it, which is one, what we've just been talking about, Dory, remote work is here to stay, okay? And this is something that that really does have many advantages for workers over 50, and there's going to be more of this. Now, one side note on that angle, on that channel, 
is this, and this does concern me, is that many of these remote jobs are contract jobs. So that if you've lost a job during the pandemic or what have you, these positions, yes, there are many full-time positions for remote work, but there are quite a few contract positions and seasonal jobs and and project-based jobs. And to me, for older workers, this is can be a red light because, you know, a flashing warning sign light. I mean, not because what it means is they're not covering your benefits, right? Mm-hmm. And so you're kind of out there self-employed in, in, in many ways. And that's it. That for many people is a new, uh, a new scenario and it can be tricky. And so employers see it as a great boon for them, right? Because it makes you a lot less expensive. But again, be wary and be really sure that that's what you're looking for. So that's the sidelight of that. The second big trend is entrepreneurship. Oh my gosh, I saw so many uh, great examples I've written about for the New York Times and for Market Watch and PBS Next Avenue about these wonderful stories of small businesses launched by people over 50 during the pandemic. Some who have, you know, lost their jobs during the pandemic or they took an early retirement package and they said, hey, guess what? This is my time. To, I don't want to deal with this looking for job stuff again right now. I, it's, I, I've been down that road. I'm really not up for that. And I've always wanted to do this. And so they, there are people that have noodling ideas. They may have even started some of these as side gigs or they're starting them as side gigs now. They're baby stepping into it. But uh, entrepreneurship for, for midlife folks is, is going to be a big trend moving forward. And and I think it's great. I absolutely love the entrepreneurial spirit. I think it's really great for workers with expertise and passion. And at this stage in life, you know, having the time and focus and the opportunities to really pursue work that they've always wanted to do it is, is just fantastic. So and there's many great resources to help there. You know, the Small Business Administration with their SCORE, S-C-O-R-E, groups around the country, great place. A lot of universities have wonderful centers for entrepreneurship that can help. There are, you know, workplace development and community developments in, in different areas. And just women, you know, groups of women business owners getting together, a whole associations of women business owners also, of course. But I do think entrepreneurship is just going to be hot, hot, hot going forward. And it has been leading up to this. I wrote that book, Never Too Old to Get Rich, a a couple of years ago, co-branded by Next Avenue. And then the third major trend is career change. Yay, that's something that I'm sure – well, Dory, actually, I bet you help your clients in all of these areas. But this this career transition, career change – this is a time this past year had a lot of people in this age category have said, hey, you know what? Maybe this has given me the time to really take a breath and think about work I've always wanted to do or the opportunity to make a shift into doing that kind of work, not starting their own business necessarily, but really just changing fields. And what I love about that, and again, I, I repeatedly say this, you're not reinventing yourself, but you're redeploying those skills that you've built up over your tremendous career into new fields and new opportunities. So those I see as our major move, moves forward. I love the use of the term redeploying your skills because I think it's, you know, what, what I often like having people do is make a list of their skills from, you know, in all capacities, parenting, you know, work, you know, way, way back throughout. And what ones do you like? What ones are you good at? What ones would you just as much like to let go of? And which ones do you want to transfer? And I love the idea of redeploying, of just thinking of how you can use them in in different situations. But also what you said before, too, about recognizing if there's some gaps, you know, and, and what, what are some skills maybe that you do need to develop so that you can be marketable. And and one trend, this isn't specifically um, pandemic-related, but it's more of our time story is, and you, I know, address this a lot, is that as we have longevity and people are staying in the workplace longer, extending their career life, their working lives, and we have the younger population coming up, which aren't as many true as the boomers, right? Mm-hmm. But there's, I see a huge amount of connection between the generations and multi generational businesses starting of teams of multi generational teams. And we've seen studies that these are more productive and successful mm-hmm. teams at work, and, and studies are showing this. Employers are recognizing this 
And there's some interesting, I have a column that went up on Market Watch on a sort of a networking group called Circle, C-I-R-K-E-L. And that connects professionals of all ages and career stages for mentorship. So it's mm-hmm. a, a senior professional working with somebody younger and so forth. But I'm telling you, this is your ticket to a new job in many ways because that younger mentee or mentor, as it could be, is really helping you at this life stage, you know, find your way, recognize your and value your skill set. Now, they may notice mm-hmm. skills in you that you've completely taken for granted, and you can help them as well. So I think there's this we're seeing more of these kind of networking opportunities coming up that I, pay, pay attention and look for those chances to work with somebody younger than you on projects, raise your hand and, and try to get involved because I think that will spark ideas as well. Excellent. And we'll maybe come back to that a little. Susan from Cambridge says, could you please explain the difference between self-employment and entrepreneurship? You know what? I think I think self-employed people are entrepreneurial. For example, I consider myself an entrepreneur and I'm also self-employed when I do my taxes. So that is, they are one and the same in many, many ways. But people tend to think of an entrepreneur as somebody who started a bricks and mortar kind of business. And, and that is one example. But entrepreneurship takes lots of forms. It can be somebody starting a consulting business at home. It can be many different things. So the self-employed category, I think of it as somebody who doesn't have their business registered as, say, necessarily an Inc. or a PLC or, you know, you're operating uh, more as a self-employed than as under a legal business entity. If you want to be formal about it, that might be one way to draw the line. But I think anyone who starts an endeavor where they're not reporting to, where they don't have just one, I think of the work when you work in houses when having just one client, you know, I always think of, even when I worked at my in-house jobs, I always thought of myself as an entrepreneur because they were my main client, but I was always freelancing. <laughs> so I think that, I, think that I, I keep the term of entrepreneur very wide and, and I think that's the way to do it. Mm-hmm. Well, I know you've written, and as you mentioned, the earlier book about kind of midlife entrepreneurs. What what what's your sense of some of the steps someone must take in order to succeed at it? Oh yeah, and you do need to take those steps because not everyone's hardwired to start their own business. And the most important thing is you start with doing that soul searching, you know, and you think about all the things that you really enjoy doing in your life or things that you've always wanted to do more of. And you do what you said you do with your clients, write down all your skills. What do you really, what are the skills that you're good at? And so you do that sort of canvassing and dreaming and drawing out that map of of different possibilities. And, you know, I like vision boards for this kind of thing. But then you also have to ask these very hard questions. Why me? Why now? Why this business or service? And this can be, these are not easy answers to these things because to truly be successful, there needs to be a niche in the marketplace for you. That you have to be bringing something to the party that someone else isn't, whether it's in your community or in a larger platform. So you need to be very, very judicious about this and very careful. You want to start, um, Slowly, I, I honestly think it's it's one step at a time. You need to lay that groundwork, and it can take you know it can take three years really to put together a great business plan and what it is you want to do. And you you start by that. You start by making sure you're financially fit going into the my physical fitness drive. But financially fit is do that budget. Can you afford to launch your own business? Uh, where your income can be a little erratic at first, or you need seed capital to get started. And most of us self-fund our own businesses or it's through friends and family, but most of it is self-funded. So do you have the resources that you can go without paying yourself for several months or even a year while you reinvest in your business? And and if not, even if it's just as a consultant, can you get by on less income than when you were in-house? Because initially, and particularly if you shift careers or shift your field to start your business, you're going to make less than you did initially until you, you get up to speed and, be, and gather some, some recommendations and endorsements for your work. So you want to do those things. You want to take the time to volunteer, to moonlight, to try to do that kind of work. It might not be precisely the kind of work you want to do, but to get an insider's view what it is. Is it as dreamy as you think it's going to be, standing back, or if it's been your hobby, you know, 
wow, it's been great. But when I'm actually out in the garden gardening for my landscape design business, is it really any fun as it was when I was using it as my escape from the crazy world that my work world. So you want to make those those choices for yourself. But there is that sort of steady and adding the skills you need. Maybe you need some more skills. You need a certification to, to hang up your shingle to do something. Take that time and do it. So I encourage people to, when you have an idea of something you'd really like to do, you know, maybe take a, do those informational interviews with people who are in those fields and really, you know, talk to them about how did they get started? What are the challenges? Where do they see the market going? People love to talk about their work. And if you're not asking them for a job and they don't see you as possibly a direct competitor, trust me, they'll, they'll be more than happy to share. And particularly during this coming out of the pandemic when we've all felt isolated and un, unloved in some respect or, unre- you know, our time not valued, having somebody hang on our every word is pretty neat. Mm-hmm. Such really excellent, excellent points that you're making. Any others that you want to add about the, the steps for entrepreneurs before I start asking other questions? Well, I think those are those are the major pieces, you know, doing the baby steps and so forth. But, yeah. but one way, you know, Dorian, I think you probably talked to, to to your network and your clients about this too. When I mentioned moon, moonlighting or apprenticing, you know, volunteering is is really a great way to step out into the world and doing the kind of work you might want to do with skills base to kind of give you ideas of where the needs might be. If you're interested, particularly if segueing into a nonprofit world, which frankly, many people in this age category, I've discovered this is a time in life where we really would like to be able to have impact on the world and to make a difference in our work. And so, you know, take the time to really, you know, think about what what mission, what matters to you and and so forth. And so, like, you know, have that mission statement for yourself and the kind of work you want to do. What do you really hope to accomplish from it? And the, the final thing, as I said at the start of this sort of loop about entrepreneurship is why me, why now, why this? And and this is there's a lot a lot of people on this call probably know Simon Sinek and his work and his book about you know what's your why and and that is something this is a great time to just sit quietly and figure out why it is that you want to do something why it is that you want to start a business and it's not just what the need is it's it's really the deep seated why what it, what is it that motivates you and is going to drive you because you know running your own shop is it's not always a dreamy situation. It's hard work, and there are ups, and there are downs, and there are setbacks, and, you know, you've got to be prepared. Right. Excellent points, right? So Maura from Paris both says hello to you, but also how do you frame the difference between a coach and a mentor? Oh, oh, my, my, my. Well, there's many layers of that, aren't there? I should, you should answer that question. <laughs> I think I think of coaching as a more formal accountability than you might. Now, you can have this in a mentor-mentee relationship or a sponsor kind of relationship without question. But I think when you set yourself up with a coach and you've hired a coach to work with you, this is a job. I mean, you've taken it on as a committed time thing where you're accountable for for completing certain tasks, your coach is really giving you that objective look, giving you steps to take, helping you with various things from your resume to your job search, but in a very targeted way. Whereas a mentor can be much more emotional, can be a little more holistic, stepping back and, and certainly helping you with different things. But but usually it's somebody who is tied to your particular field in a way. Your coach doesn't have to be in your field. And, in fact, you maybe don't want them to be because you want to have that objectivity that can come from, from that position of somebody who's trained to be a coach, has done the work, has the certifications, and understands the psychological as well as the practical steps you need to take. Your mentor can be a much more emotional sort of a guide, a Sherpa, in a different way. And usually they are within your life lane. They're in your lane at your industry or the work you do. And Dory, I I would hope it if you could add on to that answer a bit, because I think you probably have thought about that. Well, but I think you've covered it really well, that I I think that mentor can be a much more casual situation, which absolutely can include the accountability piece. But I think the coaching is really kind of co-creating with somebody and really helping the person, you know, develop 
in a sense, their mission statement or, you know, kind of their, you know, their, their roadmap of how they want to live their life. And I think there's both the accountability, the goal setting, and it, and it is more formal. I mean, I really think you covered the, you know, and in general, I think from my perspective, I think coaches should have training, you know, on sort of how they're helping and working with people. Mentors don't need that same kind of training. So it's more informal. And I think that the mentor is more, you know, talking from your own experiences, perhaps, and listening and getting to know the, you know, the person you're talking to, to, you know, try to, you know, answer their questions and just sort of help them be a role model for them in a sense. I think, I mean, that's sort of my viewpoint. I'm a huge fan of coaches and, and it's, mm-hmm. it's really deep for very good reasons. And I've talked to a lot of workers over 50 and if, who have been out of work and just stymied by the job hunt. And this goes way back before the pandemic. This is, you know, it, it's a tricky road. It's longer to get a job. It's so, the rejection is demoralizing. And right. if you can have a coach whether it's that whether your former employer helps provide you coaching or whether you can find someone through your alumni network or you, you know, have recommend someone recommends a coach to you. It is or someone that often there are classes at community colleges that coaches give workshops and you can get a one on one working with them because this person can really jumpstart you back and give you that confidence and that boost of, yeah, you're okay. It's okay. And because they see you from a different angle. They see skills that you no longer recognize in yourself. They, they kind of can look objectively and give you that step back up again and draw that, that map almost about what are, let you, they open up your perspectives in a way that, that a mentor can't do and a coach. Mm-hmm. It's one of, I think it's an essential piece of a job hunt. If you, you know, and it doesn't have to be super expensive to find someone to help you do this, but, but yes, they can look at your resume, but that's not the main part of it. It's really, uh, not getting you from trying to replicate your old job because so many people fall into that trap and trust me, you are not going to replicate your old job. Right. Maybe I think maybe that's you don't really want to. important for people to hear, right? I mean, that it's not going to, that that, in all probability is not going to happen. And and you even were saying that there, you know, there may be some full-time jobs out there, but it's, you know, 21st century is much more project work, part-time. I mean, just as you were saying before, consulting, entrepreneur, different, different world, I think. Yeah. So I have some other questions from people, but, but I wanted to just, if you could share a little, cause I know you've done so much working and writing about career transitions and all what, what would you say are the keys for people when they're going through a career transition? What's, what's important for them to know and think about? Yeah, Dory, the, the most important thing is what we mentioned earlier is what skills do you already have that are going to transfer? That doesn't have to be a big, huge, ginormous jump into something that's the great unknown. You, Many of the skill sets you already have are going to segue into whatever it is you want to do. But shifting into a new field really can ignite your excitement about work again and help you fall in love with work again and make work not that four-letter word thing. Work is something that, you know, really, you know, ignites us. And so I think that's important to recognize. So take the time to really say, okay, this is something I'm interested in transitioning into. What do I already have in my quiver? What do I, I need to add in order to be successful here? And that involves, you know, looking, scanning, looking at people who are doing those kinds of jobs. Look at their, you know, LinkedIn profiles. Talk to people who are doing those kinds of jobs. What are their, what kind of skill sets do they have? What are, we talked about employers. What are in those job postings? What do you need to add? So what do you need to add? What do you already have? And then giving yourself some time to make that transition. If you can try the job out in some respect, it's really great to be able to do that. But I find that what generally helps in making the transition is talking to people who are in that field to kind of learn the ropes of how to, how, what, how to navigate that transition and listen, 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 because you may have been the top of your field, the top of your industry, whatever it is. And you're going to be shifting into being the newcomer again and a greenhorn. And you're going to have to shift that ego a little bit in order to understand that you are going to be asking questions and not the one being asked questions. So Mm -hmm. it is a psychological shift that you will need to prepare for. But you need the skills. You need the psychological adjustment. And be patient with yourself. And really, truly be patient Mm -hmm. and be passionate. And I know that word is overused, overused. But honestly, when you're excited about 
the mission of the kind of work you do, it makes all the difference in the world and it will help with that transition and help someone who is going to hire you because they're going to say, yeah, I want this person to work for me. They, they get it. They're curious. Oh, I forgot to say that's the most important word <laughs> in your, any job, any yeah. job interview you're in or if you're starting any, you've got to be curious. And that comes down to this quest for lifelong learning. And that's what it's all about. Excellent. Well said. <laughs> All right. I want to integrate some of these questions here from others. Stuart from Mountain View says, from a different perspective, from your experience, what are two to three really big mistakes that you've seen people 50 plus make in the area of their careers? The biggest mistake is not taking risks. I think people, if you're employed and you're working in it within a structure in a corporate environment and you get to a certain stage and you quit raising your hand you quit seeking out that stretching project you quit taking on the assignments that no one else wants to do and what or saying hey you know like making yourself a little noisy and saying i want to be considered for that workplace development program, that extra education, that training, because often that shifts to a younger worker. If you aren't doing those things every day, practically in some respect, you are going to become irrelevant. You have got to stay relevant in the workplace. You can't just lay low and hope nobody notices you and that you can just keep sliding along doing what you're doing because that doesn't work anymore. Things are changing quickly. Technology has changed the workplace quickly, but just the way we work now, because remote work is, you know, as we talked about, that it's a shifting in work environment, and you have got to be be on your toes, constantly pushing. That's the biggest mistake, I think, is not getting comfortable and, and being fearful of, of failure by taking a risk. And so that is critical. The second thing is if they do change jobs, they, they again, like we talked about, try to replicate what they had before, and that, that's certainly not going to be happen. And third, maybe if they're looking for jobs, they want to do a lateral with, they don't want to, the title becomes too important to them. Well, I was a vice president or I was a senior manager. Who cares? You know, if you love the job, the title shouldn't be what it's all about. And so that's an ego thing, but again, it's something we have to work on. And it's focusing on, you know, they forget, they get caught up, people, workers, of, we all do this, get caught up in, well, I've done this and this and this, and everyone should know how wonderful I am because these are the titles I've had, these are the companies I've worked for, this is my education. But really, you need to be able to articulate very quickly your sales pitch. What, are, what have you accomplished? What are, really, you know, what are, what was, what results have you brought in? What are you really proud of? Your, your greatest hit list is uh, someone I interviewed this week, myself, Steve Dalton from the Fuqua School of Business at Duke University. He says, you need your greatest hits list and, and really focus on that instead of, you know, blah, blah, blah. These are my responsibilities. Nobody really cares about your responsibilities in a job. They want to know your accomplishments in that job. Mm-hmm. Great. Thank you. All right. And Barbara from Barona says, any specific suggestions on how to do, arrive or discover one's why? Do you recommend career coaching, yoga, long walks, journaling? Oh, wow. I just love that question. <laughs> it is multifaceted. There's so many ways. I mean, the, the biggest thing, uh, I think, is to sit quiet with yourself, really. And uh, it's hard to turn off the noise and the chatter. But for me, that's taking long walks or being out in the country or somewhere where I can pull back from electronics and other voices and really give myself that chance to to wander, let my mind kind of wander and and be honest with myself and not and tune out some of those other people who are always trying to give you advice and tell you what you should be doing and what you should you know, your why only you know it. It's your North Star and people use that phrase a lot, but it's true. It's really what gets you up in the morning, what it is that matters to you. And and journaling is a great way to just, you know, unload some of that stuff. Vision boards help. There's so many ways to go after it, and you'll just peel back till you get to the core of it. But a lot of it is, is the solitude and the time alone to do that. And, you know, I, I came for myself, I, I, I kept thinking about, you know, as a freelancer and working for myself and getting lots of invitations to write different kinds of articles and different sorts of, of opportunities to speak. And I kept saying, what, 
I got to learn to say no. I got to learn to say no to people and to these possibilities. And I finally said, what, what's my guiding point? What is my why? Why is it? What should I be doing? And I realized if, if an assignment or whatever it is, I can make a difference in someone's life for the better, then I'm going to do it. And I'm not, I, can, I don't care what the pay is necessarily or what have you. If that hits my core why, I'm going to give it good consideration. And so mm-hmm. every single thing I take on, it makes it much easier to say no. <laughs> That sounds so, I keep saying that, that, but it does, it's so important to think about that because it's tied into what, what, at this point in our life, what do we say yes to and what do we say no to? And I think you're right that, you know, the more we know ourselves and know what's important and what we can contribute and why we want to contribute, the more we're going to be able to do that. But it is taking time to to reflect and get to know yourself. And and I like that idea, too, of what are some of the things you're really a proud of what are your accomplishments so that you know that's what motivates you rather than just the job title or as, as you've been saying can i go ahead the thing i want to add to my thing well we were talking about career transitions and and again a lot of people at this stage in life like the idea of shifting into maybe nonprofit work or doing work for the the greater good and there are some and it could not necessarily have to be on that lane it could be just shifting to some a different field but i would seek out also fellowships and internships and some of those mm-hmm. are more and more coming up worth doing some i have i also have a list of those and and that various books i've written and probably articles i've written but i know encore.org has a wonderful fellowship i recently wrote about for next avenue i would look into that i would look into not shifting to nonprofit work but but during the pandemic, it really got up ahead of steam. And I, there are others out there that I encourage folks to look for. And if even if it's a job or a company you're interested in, maybe they will offer you an internship or a way to get in and try it out in a more formal fashion. Great. And so Meg from Cambridge <laughs> makes a suggestion that maybe next time you'll, your next book will focus on the 75-plus group and the hybrid model oh. for work likely unpaid learning support community so after wow, this one comes out in november maybe you'll you'll you jump to the to the next stage i think <laughs> i jump it up i no meg thank you i think that is a super idea because somebody was telling me just today about there's a new podcast like 70 over 70 or something and mm-hmm. something that sounds fantastic and i do think this is you know there's some wonderful creativity and interesting angles and also you know shifting of what we always say you know what a worker at 50 is looking at in their 50s and someone in their 60s and someone in their 70s it's a completely different kind of work we might be motivated mm-hmm. to go after or need to go after or want to go after so thank you very much i think you're right on there good why don't you just say where they can get your book and what your website is so everybody who has to get off now hears that carrie all right. Well, thank you. My website is com, so it's pretty easy, K-E-R-R-Y-H-A-N-N-O-N.com. And I have some of my books up there. You can click on them, and they'll take you to Amazon. But you can find my books on Amazon, but you can find them on Barnes & Noble and Indie Bound and, you know, your favorite community bookstore. Please support them. And if they don't have it in stock, say, could you order it, please? <laughs> so so there, there are lots of ways to go and seek it out. And there are audio books, there are Kindle, there are, you know, paperbacks. And uh, yeah, I, I really would love to connect with you there. And if you know anyone wants to reach out to me with individual questions or referrals to different resources, please do because it's Carrie K E R R Y at CarrieHannon dot com is my email. So I'm always open to hear from people, and you know that's part of communicating, right? <laughs> Great, and you are terrific at that. I just wanted to to ask another. I mean, just other things that maybe are going to be coming out, but that also that you've spoken about, because I know you write a lot and speak a lot about women and money, and so I just wonder if there are kind of any tips that you have for, for women over 50, or over, and if they are different for women over 50, over 60, over 70? Oh, gosh. You know, my main, <laughs> my main message to women of, really, it's of all ages, but certainly women at, at this stage of life is you've got to really take care of yourself financially. You can't expect anybody else to care about your money the way you do. And so it's, it, you can't get away with saying, bores me. I'm not good at math. I'm not interested. You know what? It, it, it is interesting. It is your life and it is your financial security moving forward. So take the time 
to educate yourself if you're not already and reach out, ask questions, find the only planner or someone who maybe can guide you a bit, That's who's a fiduciary, who puts your interests first, you know, who looks at your whole life as important, not just how you're investing your money. It's your holistic life. And, and this is, there's no excuses anymore to hide behind anyone else who's going to manage your money or chart your future path because women over 50 tend to be so aging solo at some point in their lives. They're widowed, they're divorced, and you just got to know your, you got to take care of yourself. And so women tend to work for free for many instances. They, 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 t- they spend money on others before themselves. So start putting yourself first. So final question. You've also written a book about ways to love your job. Any advice here for, again, older workers, how to get that passion, as you're saying? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Again, you know, as I said, when I ask people what do they really love about their job, they rarely tell me it's the job itself, right? They tell me it's the people they work with. It is the mission of the company or the the product they produce. It's their pride. It's pride in who they work for and what kind of work they do. Not the specific job, but it's really the 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 company itself or the nonprofit. And it's you know they it's this sense of of being constantly learning. If they're if in their work they're they're learning new things all the time or and so forth. So it's not it's getting past the inertia of a job and we kind of addressed that a bit earlier. So I think the things you need to do if you want to stay engaged and fall in love with your work again is A, keep learning. If there's one thing you can do is learn something new because your whole mind mm-hmm. shifts. You start seeing the world differently. You start asking questions again and it just fires you up. So it's great if it's related to your job and your work, but if it's not, that's fine too because it gets you in that student mode again, and that gets you excited about lots of different things. I think trying to volunteer or do something outside of work with your colleagues, and now that we're getting back in the world, but you could do this virtually before, whether it's doing a volunteer opportunity, a walking group, a softball thing. Even at at this age, we can be doing team sports like that, bowling. I don't care what it is, but it's something you do outside of the workplace with your colleagues to to keep building that camaraderie and, and so forth. So I think those are some really simple things. And the most important thing I, when I wrote that, well, there are two fun things. One is, everywhere, I love this piece of advice is, you know, declutter, you know, clean up your office for gosh mm-hmm. sakes. You know, once mm-hmm. you start cleaning things up and throwing things away, you, it's liberating and you are making decisions about your life. I value this. I don't value this. I value this. It sounds simple, but truthfully, it's empowering. And the, <laughs> the final thing is laugh a little bit more when you're in a work situation, when you're doing your job, smile, laugh, say something funny to your colleague laugh at their joke because the studies have shown Gallup studies have proven and they've shown this over and over again that employees who laugh more at work are more engaged in their jobs and so there you have it that's the ticket to happiness <laughs> sounds wonderful any last little <laughs> takeaways you want people to have I know you've mentioned so many important things that we really weren't able to really get into depth like the intergenerational and you know I mean which I I know was important I think it's really important to lifelong learning, all these things that, but any final takeaways, we'll just have to have you come again. I mean, you know. Oh, yes, um, yes, please. Maybe I want to, yeah, I think we all need to get together in person. But anyway, here's the thing. It's so, you know, God, blah, blah, you'll say, but uh, believe in yourself, for gosh sakes. you got so much going on. We all have so much to offer. And, you know, we've been isolated. We've been separated from each other. We may have been downsized from a job or stepped away from our workplace, we're looking at our jobs differently. We're looking at what matters to us. You know, we've seen the, the the shock of how life changes on you quickly. So, you know, embrace your moments, embrace your your you, embrace what makes you unique and, and give it back to others. That's the most important thing we can do each day. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us and sharing your perspective and wisdom, Carrie. It's just, you've just, You've given so much to so many people in the ways that you think about things and the frame and the writing and connecting people. So thank you for being you. And I hope you you will come back again. (laughs) (laughs) You know I will. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. And thanks, everybody, for being here. And just everybody stay well and safe as the world's slowly kind of opening up in some ways. So take care. Bye-bye. You've been listening to Revolutionize Your Retirement Radio with Dr. Dorian Mincer. 
To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show, listen to past episodes, or download our free retirement transition guide, visit revolutionizeyourretirementradio.com.